a lot of people have spoken for a while now about how carbohydrates can lead to a deficiency in vitamin C and how people on carnivore diets have tiny amounts of vitamin C in their diet, but they never get deficiency problems. However, there's more to the story than that. And today I want to show you guys what I think has possibly been missing from this particular knowledge when people have spoken about it before. Firstly, there's two types of vitamin C, as far as we're concerned in this particular context. You see, most people would just think of ascorbic acid, but the two types are the reduced and oxidized forms, ascorbic acid and dehydroascorbic acid. We got both forms of loads of molecules, like for example, NADH and NAD+, are reduced and oxidized forms of each other. Both forms of vitamin C are taken in by the cells because the oxidized form can be converted back to the reduced form, ascorbic acid, once it's inside. Most people will talk about how GLUT4 is you know, involved in vitamin C going into the cell. That's correct, but it's only part of the picture. Here are the transport mechanisms that we use. First, there's sodium-dependent vitamin C transporters called SVCTs. There's SVCT1 and 2, and they allow the reduced form of ascorbic acid into the cell using a sodium gradient. That alone should tell you what cofactors are needed for vitamin C regulation and why certain people get less or more effect from vitamin C supplementation than others. We've also got glucose transporters called glutes, GLUTs, glute 1, 3, and 4, can take the oxidized form, which is dehydroascorbic acid, into the cells. But because vitamin C and glucose are so similar in atomic structure, they can both use the same entry method and create competition with each other. However, glucose can inhibit the vitamin C's entry when there's loads of it around, for example, when you have carbohydrates in your diet. And that makes sense because... Glucose is a fuel source at the end of the day, which we need in order to use for things like making ATP, adenosine triphosphate, our cellular energy currency. So it's a good thing that the vitamin C is second in priority to the fuel source and that it can be shut out when there's dietary carbohydrates present. It's an adaptation. However, remember that we also have SVCT1 and 2 to allow vitamin C inside the cell. Glucose doesn't actually compete with ascorbic acid for SVCTs because SVCTs don't transport glucose. But even when these gates are open to vitamin C, we can still have affected vitamin C levels inside cells thanks to dietary carbohydrates because dehydroascorbic acid, the oxidized form that comes in with GLUT1, 3, and 4, and is in competition with glucose, that accounts for the majority of the cell's vitamin C source. Now, I hope that's easy to understand. Rewind and rewatch if you need. But if it's not too easy uh, and you don't get it at all, then this video isn't designed for you because this is for people that want more advanced knowledge and you're better off watching someone else if you don't want this level of detail. Now, where we've got to the story so far is generally where the conversation stops. But I want to go a little bit further so you can understand how certain supplements can disrupt vitamin C regulation and how other factors in your life and body can affect whether you have a deficiency or not, even if you know, you're going to age prematurely or not by looking at this. So let's start by looking into the SVCTs a little bit more. Again, this stands for Sodium Dependent Vitamin C Transporter. So SVCT1 is mainly in the epithelial tissues like intestines and kidneys. Epithelial tissues are, if you don't know, they're the lining on surfaces. And uh, SVCT2, that's in most other tissues. So there's a geographic component to the differences between SVCT1 and 2. Now for the glucose transporters, GLUT1, 3, and 4, there's differences as well. GLUT1's pretty much everywhere and it heavily takes in glucose. GLUT3 is highly expressed in neurons, which are nerves. And there's a really high affinity for glucose here to massively minimize the amount of vitamin C absorption when we eat carbohydrates. Now, both of these two, interestingly, they don't need insulin to get glucose through and into the cell. GLUT4, on the other hand, does need insulin, and it's in the places like, say, fat and muscle. So we've spoken now about the biochemistry of how vitamin C goes into the cell, but I think it's important to also know what happens once it's inside, because if you see that, then you can even understand how certain supplements and antioxidants can fit into the picture that you've probably heard of. You see, once the oxidized vitamin C, which is dehydroascorbic acid, is inside the cell, 
it can actually be converted back into the reduced form of ascorbic acid using reducing agents like glutathione to get that done. That's why eating vitamin C that may get oxidized during the chewing process, for instance, isn't a death sentence for it. We can convert it back to the reduced form, or which is ascorbic acid, once it's actually inside the cells. And if we have elevated glucose levels, like when we're eating carbohydrates in our diet, then that can disrupt the ratio between oxidized and reduced vitamin C, which is called the redox potential. When that happens, it can affect our ability to convert the oxidized form into the reduced form, ascorbic acid. But as well as that, the higher glucose can increase not just oxidative stress, but the amount of ROS, R-O-S, that we have. And, and that's a reactive oxygen species, which if you don't know, it's a highly unstable version of oxygen that can cause damage, a bit like a ping pong ball or a pinball, pinging around the cell and just bashing everything in its way to cause structural defects. And if we get damage to our DNA, we're in big trouble uh, at that point. Now, when we get this damaging reactive oxygen species in the cell, we have to fight it. And we do that using cellular antioxidants. Makes sense, antioxidants, oxidative stress, like ascorbic acid, which is the reduced vitamin C. So even if we eat enough vitamin C, if we have dietary carbohydrates that leads to increased glucose levels, which then causes higher amounts of oxidative stress, then we can still get vitamin C deficiency because the amount that we do have is being used to fight those free radicals instead of things that it would be used for in healthy times that can prevent us from getting things like scurvy. Now, we can also see impaired conversion of the oxidized vitamin C into the reduced form when there's high amounts of oxidative stress around, which is another way we can get lower amounts of vitamin C inside the cell. So to summarize, we can use more than just GLUT4, glucose transporter 4, to get vitamin C into the cell. We have GLUT1, 3, and 4 altogether. We also have sodium-dependent vitamin C transporters, SVCT1 and 2. Glucose hinders vitamin C entry when we eat dietary carbohydrates because of the competition between both molecules for entry. The reduced vitamin C form ascorbic acid that uses SVCTs and the oxidized form dehydroascorbic acid uses glutes. When we're eating dietary carbohydrates, we hinder the vitamin C regulation not just by affecting entry into the cells due to glucose competition, but also by causing vitamin C to be used up fighting free radicals caused by the higher glucose loads, which then worsens the ability to convert into the reduced vitamin C form of ascorbic acid once the oxidized form enters inside. So if you're going to supplement the vitamin C, then you need to make sure you take it outside of meal times if your meals contain carbohydrates. If you're a carnivore like myself, you don't have carbohydrates in your meals. So even though your total intake of vitamin C is very low, compared to, say, the standard Western diet, we have no deficiency because the amount that's in the meat is all being absorbed thanks to no glucose competition. So when you look at the daily recommended intake guidelines for vitamin C, they're written for people on a standard Western diet. That's why people like myself who eat much less than the recommended daily amounts of vitamin C don't get any deficiency symptoms, even though we're actually barely eating any.